This is Homeschool 101, a collaboration between ABS Television and the Ministry of Education. Stay attentive and attempt all activities. And now, today's lesson. Hello, welcome to Homeschool 101. My name is Nikisha Smith and I'll be teaching you Caribbean Studies. Today's topic is going to be Intellectual Traditions. On completing this section, you'll be able to describe the history and the values underlying a number of Caribbean ideologies and intellectual traditions, identify the key thinkers in each of these intellectual traditions, and analyze the impact of each of these ideologies on Caribbean development. Let's get started. So what are ideologies or intellectual traditions? An ideology is a set of strong beliefs about how social life can be improved or should operate. They tell us what is considered acceptable or not acceptable in how we think about certain questions. White superiority, male domination, capitalism, industrialization, native society, etc. Some ideologies or ways of strong beliefs are mainstream while others are marginal or contested. So not everybody believes in them. So when a group commits to an ideology and begins to write, act, or analyze social life according to that ideology, an intellectual tradition is formed. So this section will describe nine different intellectual traditions in the Caribbean. So the first will be Pan-Africanism, which is one of the black consciousness type of intellectual traditions. So this section will be dealing with those. What is Pan-Africanism? It is a political, cultural, and intellectual phenomenon which regards Africa, Africans, and African descendants as a unit. It seeks to regenerate and unify Africa and promote a feeling of oneness among the people of the African world. It glorifies the African past and inculcates pride in African values. So it's trying to promote black consciousness. It is an idea that people of African descent share a common history, no matter where they are in the world, um, common culture and experience, and they should be together because of their common background. The concept of Pan-Africanism was conceived by people of African descent mainly in the Caribbean and in the United States. We're going to now look at some leaders in the Pan-Africanism movement. So we have here W.E.B. Dubois, um, born in 1868 and died in 1963. He's one of the most influential pan early Pan-Africanists and he helped to found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People NAACP and organized several Pan-African Congresses. His work was particularly um, influential in that he was the first black person to, be, to get a doctorate from Harvard and his research into the lives of post-slavery um, black people in America showed that segregation was not the way and pushed, he pushed towards integration. And it was his ideas and his recommendations that were in, incorporated into the civil rights um, legislation. And that took effect a year after he died. Another Pan-Africanist, we have Edward Wilmot Blyden, born in 1832 died in 1912. He's a leading black intellectual and scholar of African culture. He was born in the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean. He moved to the West African nation of Liberia in 1851 and promoted the repatriation, that means going back to Africa, of free African blacks to, to Liberia. He hoped that Liberia as an independent black ruled nation will become a beacon of Pan-Africanism displaying the great achievements of Africans and people of African descent. This is what he looks like. And now we come to one of the most popular, well-known, influential Pan-Africanists, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. 
born in 1887 and died in 1940. This is one of his quotes, you cannot be independent if you owned nothing. And this just means that independence is tied to economic independence. So, as a part of some of his achievements, he founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, in 1914, which sought to promote the improvement of living conditions for black Africans and people of black African descent in North and South America, the Caribbean, and Europe. He created the whole Back to Africa movement in the United States. In a quote from a speech given in 1921, Gavi explains the goal of the UNIA. We of the Universal Negro Movement in Improvements Association are raising the cry of Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. There are 400 million Africans in the world who have Negro blood coursing through their veins. And we believe that the time has come to unite these 400 million people for the one common purpose of bettering their condition. He founded an international movement. His newspaper, The Negro World, achieved wide distribution. Branches of UNIA sprung up all over the Americas, as well as in Europe, Australia, and South Africa. By 1919, his following had reached two, two million. In 1919, he established a shipping company, the Black Star Line, and the Negro Factories Corporation to encourage black economic independence. He hoped to enter international trade and to tra transport blacks to Africa. He also hoped to oversee the repatriation of tens of thousands of American blacks to the West African nation of Liberia, which had been founded by freed American slaves in the early 19th century. He also opened a chain of restaurants, grocery stores, laundries, a hotel, and a printing press. Remember his earlier quote, you, have to, you can't be independent if you don't own anything. So um, that was what he was trying to establish, black people owning things, and of course supporting black businesses. The Garvey movement declined when Garvey was arrested and imprisoned in 1925 on charges of mail fraud relating to the operation of the Black Star Line. His repatriation scheme was never fulfilled. Garvey moved back to London, England, where he died in 1940. His body was returned to Jamaica in 1964. So the impact of Pan-Africanism, Pan or the other term that is known by, is Garveyism. The Rastafari movement, a black consciousness movement, was influ influenced very heavily by the ideas of Garveyism. Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, and Tony Rebel, etc., all use reggae music to amplify the message of freedom for Africans. The trade union movement was also influenced by Garveyism because Garvey was very strong about uh, women's rights, education, and also workers' rights. It stimulated the liberation movements in the region. So a lot of um, prime ministers, um, labor union, unionists um, followed his ideals. And then you have the revival and stimulation of black pride. So the next ideology is Rastafari. Rastafari, sometimes termed Rastafarianism, is an Ab Ab uh, <coughs> Abrahamic, Abrahamic, right. Rastafari, sometimes termed Rastafarianism, is an Abrahamic religion that developed in Jamaica during the 1930s. Rastafari practitioners are commonly known as, as Rastafari, Rastafarians, or Rastas. Rastas refer to their beliefs which are based on a specific interpretation of the Bible as Rasta, 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 
Rastas refer to their beliefs which are based on a specific interpretation of the Bible as Rasta Logi. Central is a monotheistic belief in a single God, referred to as Jah, who partially resides within each individual. Rastas place emphasis on what they regard as living naturally, adhering to an idol diet, so that's um, very all plant-based, um, twisting their hair into dreadlocks and following patriarchal gender roles. The Rastafarian colors are red, green, and gold, as we see here in this flag. Sometimes black is added. These colors are chosen because red signifies the blood of those killed for the cause of the black community throughout Jamaican history. Green represents Jamaica's vegetation and hope for the eradication of suppression. Gold symbolizes the wealth of Ethiopia and black signifies the color of the Africans who initiated Rastafari. The Rastafarian symbol, the lion, as we see here, is a symbol of Rastafari. This lion represents Haile Selassie, who is referred to as the conquering lion of Judah. Rastafarian's dreadlocks represent the lion's mane. Um, Haile Selassie, seen here, he's the emperor of, emperor of Ethiopia between 1930 and 1964 and is given central importance in Rastafari. Uh, many Rastas regard him as an interpretation of Jah on earth and as the second coming of Christ. Others regard him as the human prophet who fully recognized the inner divinity in every individual. Um, the Rastafari religion developed in the slums of Kingston, Jamaica in the 1920s and 30s and it began with the teachings of Marcus Garvey who we learned about earlier and he is considered to be a black Jamaican who led the Back to Africa movement. He taught that Africans are the true Israelites and have been exiled to Jamaica and other parts of the world as divine punishment. Gabi is regarded as a second John the Baptist and famously prophesied in 1927, look to Africa for there a king shall be crowned. And so that's why the Rastafari um, look to Haile Selassie, Selassie as a person. So key figures of the Rastafari movement, you have Leonard P. Howell, seen here. Leonard Percival Howell, also known as the Gong or Gigi Maraj, was a Jamaican religious figure. Howell was born on the 16th of June, 1898, into an Anglican family and died on the 25th of February, 1981. He was one of the first preachers of the Rastafari movement and is known by many as the first Rasta. Howell perhaps had no idea that the movement which he started on the streets of Kingston would become one of the most influential move movements of the 20th and 21st century. Leonard Howell showed that you didn't have to be dread to be Rasta. He established the, Kings, the King of Kings mission out of respect for Selassie and appointed himself Selassie's representative in Jamaica. He wrote his first book about Rastafarianism entitled The Promise Key. He also set up the first Rastafarian village in Jamaica on 400 acres of St. Acres of St. Catherine land after being incarcerated for several years. Another key figure, Bob Marley. Robert Nesta Marley was a Jamaican singer-songwriter who became an international musical and cultural icon, blending mostly reggae, ska, and rock steady in his compositions. When Jamaica gained its independence, it in turn sparked a civil war. In the midst of this animosity, Bob created some of what may, many believe was the world's most inspiring music. He was substantially inspired by Marcus Garvey, again, and had anti-imperialist and pan-Africanist themes in many of his songs, such as Zimbabwe, Exodus, Survival, Black Man Redemption, and Redemption Song. 
No individual in history is more closely associated with smoking marijuana or herb, as it is called in Rastafarian culture, than, than him. Mali considered cannabis a healing herb, a sacrament, and an aid to medication. He supported the legislation of the drug. In June of 1978, Bamali was awarded the Peace Medal of the Third World from the United Nations. In February of 1981, he was awarded the Jamaican Order of Merit, which is the nation's third highest on honor. In 2006, a blue plaque was unveiled at his first UK residence in London, dedicated to him by the Nubian Jack Community Trust and supported by Her Majesty's Foreign Office. In 2010, Bob Marley's reggae album, Catch a Fire, was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, and Time Magazine named Exodus the best album of the 20th century. Reggae, especially Marley's music, has spread the Rastafarian message into non-Caribbean cultures and societies. So what has this movement or this ideology committed, um, contributed to Caribbean development? Today, Rastafari is found in many countries. It is no longer confined to the grassroots members of society. Persons of all strata in society now follow its belief system and body of rituals. Rastafarians have promoted an interest in African culture and history and communication with African people everywhere. Rastafari is one of many cultures that impacts our everyday life in the Caribbean society, from its taste in music, food, and to setting trends in the world of fashion. It is well known internationally for its distinguished lifestyle and ideology. The legalization of marijuana is also due to the efforts of Rastafari over the years to convince the mainstream society of the benefits of its use. You're watching Homeschool 101. We now move on to negritude. What is negritude? Negritude refers to consciousness of and pride in the cultural and physical aspects of the African heritage or the state or condition of being black. Negritude is a literary and political movement founded in Paris in the 1930s by a group of students from the French Caribbean and Africa. The founding members, Aimé Césaire, Léopold Senghor, and Léon Demas, hope to eliminate the barriers between black students from the various French colonies. They were not only concerned with the cooperation between blacks within the group, but also with the well-being and unity of the black race. This concern sparked the cultural movement we call Negritude. Leopold Senghor, 1906 to 2001. He was a Senegalese poet, politician, and cultural theorist who for two decades served as the first president of Senegal, 1960 to 1980. Ideologically an African socialist, he was the first major theoretician of negritude. He defines negritude in his poems and writings, rejects the classical white or black view that races can be mutually exclusive, meaning it's either this or that, but he's saying that just race is a reality. I do not mean racial ant antagonism, a, a racial purity. Ah. Race is reality. I do not mean racial purity. There is difference, but not inferiority or antagonism. So basically what he's saying is that races can coexist peacefully. Senghor believed in the expression of values of traditional Africa as they are embodied in the thinking and institutions of African society, but he did not desire return to outmoded customs, only to their original spirit. His interpretation of negritude has become the most clear definition and a model for other writers. M. S. Cesaire, 1913-2008. He was born in Basque Point, Martinique. He was a lower class citizen, but he was still learned to read and write. Césaire traveled to Paris to attend the Lycée Louis Le Grand on an educational scholarship. In Paris, he passed the exam for the École Normale Supérieure in 1935 and created the literary review, L'Étudiant Noir, The Black Student with Leopold 
Senghor and Leon Demas. Cesare served as president of the Regional Council of Martinique from 1983 to 1988. He retired from politics in 2001. He wrote, he wrote Discourse sur le Colonialisme, Discourse and Colonialism, a denunciation of European colonial racism, decadence, and hypocrisy that was republished in the French Review, Présence Africaine, in 1955. In 1960, he published Toussaint L'Ouverture, based on the life of the Haitian revolutionary. And in 1969, he published the first version of Un Tampon, Tempête, a radical adaptation of Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, for a black audience. So he wrote a lot. How, did negative, how has negative impacted on the Caribbean development? Well, it had an impact on many Caribbean writers such as Derek Walcott, also the first Nobel Prize winner for literature in the Caribbean. Negritude was embraced with greater enthusiasm in Haiti and Cuba than in the Commonwealth Caribbean because of the influence of Marxism, which we'll, we will um, describe later on. Negritude inspired the birth of many movements across the Afro-diasporic world, including Afro-surrealism, Creolite in the Caribbean, and Black is Beautiful in the United States. Franz Fanon, who wrote The Wretched of the Earth, and black skins, white mass, often made reference to negritude in his writing. That's the end of the black consciousness ideologies. Now we're going to move into the economic ideologies. So the first is Marxism and Socialism. What is Marxism and Socialism? According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, Marxism can be described as the political, economic, and social theories of Karl Marx, including the belief that the struggle between social classes is a major force in history and that there should be a society in which there are no classes. Socialism can be described as a way of organizing a society in which major industries are owned and controlled by the government rather than by individual people and companies. So the history. The concept of Marxism was developed by the German philosopher, economic, economist, and sociologist Karl Marx. He developed the concept based on his analysis of economic development during the Industrial Revolution of the mid-19th century. In his Communist Manifesto, published in 1848, um, the most celebrated pamphlet in the history of the socialist movement, Marx was critical of the capitalist mode of production and the consequences of, for persons in such societies. The central concept of Marxism is the nature of capitalism and its exploitative effects. So some central concepts of Marxism. So a capitalist society is one in which you have large investments of capital and this is made by a small group of people, a group of persons for the production of goods with the aim of maximizing profit. So Marx argues that the accumulation of this wealth comes from the exploitation of the masses, the, otherwise known as the proletariat. The exploitation comes in the form of low wages, far below the value of the goods produced for the proletariat, while the capitalist obtains the difference between the wage and the value of the, com the commodity, the profits. So Marx argued that the economic dominance of this small minority influences the political structure of these societies. Therefore, the government, the schools, the churches, judiciary, as well as beliefs and values will reflect the values of the ruling class, also known as the bourgeoisie. How has uh, Marxism and socialism affected the Caribbean? Um, there were many leaders, especially in the 60s and the 70s, who subscribed to this belief. First up is Michael Manley. Um, he adopted democratic socialism in Jamaica in 1972. Manley rose to power in Jamaica in 1972 against the backdrop of social unrest and widespread call for welfare reform. Manley therefore developed a deep-seated commitment to social justice and equality because of the stark realities he's faced as president of the National Workers' Union, NWU, 
where he represented poor workers against wealthy employers. Michael Manley, in efforts in keeping with the Marxist and socialist ide ideologies, embarked, embarked on a nationalization program of owning the major majority of shares in the telephone and electricity companies as well as the transport system. So this is nationalization is making private companies public owned. In order to increase revenue in Jamaica, Manley imposed a 75% bauxite levy on all bauxite companies operating in the country. He passed legislation to protect the vulnerable such as the Family Court Act, Maternity Leave Act and the Minimum Wage Act. However, due to debt incurred by this government, um, they were not able to fully um, implement all of the measures that they wanted to do. Forbes Burnham, Corporate Socialism in Guyana. After independence from Britain in 1966, the Lyndon Forbes Burnham regime adopted a socialist type of economic development. Burnham amended the Constitution of 1966 to reflect the fundamental nature of cooperative socialism to the Guyanese people. That's why they're, um, in, in their system they have a president rather than a prime minister as the head of government. The principal objectives of the new political system was to extend socialist democracy such that the citizens would participate in the management and decision making process of the state. Burnham started a process of nationalization in sugar, bauxite and communication sectors with the aim of redistributing wealth to the masses through social programs such as health and education. However, due to the government's lack of financial resources, it made it difficult to coordinate its activities and the increasing debt burden of Guyana during this time led to the government turning to the IMF negative turn. Maurice Bishop, Socialism in Grenada. The aim of Maurice Bishop and the New Jewel Movement, NJM, was to rid the country from colonial political thinking under the leadership of Eric Geary. Bishop displayed socialist tendencies of nationalization of banks, transportation, and the media. He sought to improve the conditions of work through progressive labor legislations, improvement in health, and in education. He joined alliances with Cuba and other countries in the Far East who were, um, had communist leadings. Under such alliances, the Cubans gave technical support in the building of the Point Salines Airport in Grenada and the awarding of scholarships to Grenadians to study in Cuba. Unlike Jamaica and Guyana, where the socialist experiment proved disastrous because of the heavy debt burden, the Grenadian socialist experiment was short-lived because of internal conflict. Grenada was invaded by um, the US in the early 80s and Bishop was killed. So that ended the socialism experiment. Conclusion, socialism and Marxism infiltrated all Caribbean countries to some extent. For example, in Antigua, the existence of the medical benefit scheme, the social um, security scheme, and the nationalization of public utilities were all influenced by the idea that resources should be publicly owned and the vulnerable in society should be protected, in this case, the elderly and the sick. Marxist perspectives help us to understand the conflict in Caribbean societies, the economic crises are still inherent to Caribbean societies now, and in recent years, these crises have become more severe and frequent. Those with economic power still have the disproportionate influence over the superstructure. The next intellectual tradition is industrialization by invitation. So in the 1930s, the English-speaking Caribbean was still characterized by political control resting with the colonial rulers. In this era, there were a series of riots and general labor unrest over improper and sometimes harsh working conditions in the Caribbean. The industrialization by invitation strategy resulted from a study that Sir Arthur Lewis produced in 1949 
following the spate of Caribbean rebellions due to the prevailing high level of poverty in the region, indicated by high unemployment, poor housing, and a narrow sector based on sugar. Industrialization by invitation thesis was offered as a solution to the problems of the Caribbean development at the time, where there was an unlimited supply of labor, um, which will keep wages down and thus produce cheaper commodities. His proposal was that the economies of the Caribbean sphere could become compet competitive producers of um, manufacturers. In his policy advice, Sir Arthur Lewis specifically emphasized that the type of industrial goods that these economies should specialize in were those which were intensive in the use of their abundant natural resources. So if your country produced bauxite, focus on that. If you're good at nutmeg, focus on that. If you're good, if you're good at producing sugar, focus on that. Right. He recommended that the capital and markets for this industrialization process be sourced from established foreign multinational corporations, or MNCs. So some key ideas of industrialization by invitation. A country should specialize in manufacturers to which its resources are most appropriate and avoid the others. This is so that countries were not competing against each other. And to start manufacturing in a new country is a formidable enough problem. Therefore, countries must seek manufacturers who are already established in the market and try to persuade them to set up branches in the new country. So he thought that getting money from businesses outside of the region to set up branches in the Caribbean was the best idea. These multinationals would bring with them the vital access to markets. These products could be sold to the dominant industrial markets and to nearby Latin America. Some concessions by the governments um, to enable this process would be things such as freedom from US income taxes, tax-free repatriation of profits, free construction of industrial plants equipped with utilities, duty-free importation of machinery, um, year-long tax holidays, and of course, the low wages, which were promised. <clears throat> Sir Arthur Lewis, the person who came up with the idea, he's a St. Lucian born to Antiguan parents, um, born in um, January, on January 23rd, 1915. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the London School of Economics, a PhD in Industrial Economics from the same institution. He published a series of articles as professor at University of Manchester and later became professor in economics at Princeton University. There is now a center for economics um, named after him at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. Some other achievements, He's a, he was the economic advisor to the Minister of Ghana, Deputy Managing Director of the UN Special Fund, Vice Chancellor of the University of West Indies from, in 1959. He was knighted in, knighted in 1963. Instrumental in helping setting up the, the Caribbean Development Bank, um, for which he held the position of the director. And in 1979, he won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics, becoming the first black person to win a Nobel Prize in a category other than peace. He died in, on June 15, 1991. So, um, some of the examples of industrialization by invitation in the Caribbean. You have in 1947, Puerto Rico launched an industrial initiative called Operation Bootstrap. Um, capital investment increased from 1.4 billion to 24 billion by 1979. In the 1950s, Trinidad launched its industrialization by invitation program to get its natural gas manufacturing started. In the 1950s, Barbados launched Operation Beehive, which uh, focused on the garment industries. And in the 1950s, Jamaica invited North American companies such as Reynolds, Alcon, and Kaiser to mine bauxite. Now, the results of industrialization by invitation are conflicted. Some advantages was that it stimulated new investment in the region, example in Puerto Rico. It fueled a reduction of the high unemployment situation, um, example in the Barbados garment sector. 
and it stimulated the export sector and earned additional foreign exchange for the, for the host country. It encouraged the establishment of manufacturing industries by Caribbean entrepreneurs, and the, the program led to the full utilization of physical resources such as bauxite and gold. Some disadvantages, it did not create the level of employment opportunities that were envisaged. Knowledge of how to run the business was, was supposed to be passed on to the locals, but there was no provision to train citizens to organize and run the plants. The multinational corporations took advantage of the long tax holidays and low-wage regimes by moving to other destinations when the holidays were over. And um, an example of that is the exit of Intel and Caribbean data services, which drew many workers into absolute poverty. It created a dependence on North American capital in the Caribbean. So in order to start a business, you had to get external capital outside of the region. And of course, this creates a problem for sustainable development because if a company that the country is dependent on for employment suddenly picks up and moves away, that's going to leave a lot of people in economic problems. And another problem is most of the profits were repatriated to the northern parent companies. It did not stay in the, um, the Caribbean country. So therefore, the, profit, uh, the benefits were not fully reaped. So the conclusion is that although the strategy failed, it still remains the basis of the hotel industry in the Caribbean. Um, you have foreign-owned businesses establishing bases in the countries with significant concessions by the government, example, tax-free holidays, free land, etc., with low wages offered to local staff and limited upper management opportunities. So, that's interesting. You're watching Homeschool 101. The next economic intellectual tradition is dependency theory. So, this is an example of Wallacean's world systems model, which forms the basis of the dependency theory. In this, you have the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery countries. So the core countries would be the e geographically advantaged countries, which exploit the peripheral countries. So those will be the ones with money, with the capital and the uh, expertise, mainly North America, Europe, also Japan and Australia. The periphery countries would be the least developed countries in the world, and they are exploited for cheap labor, raw materials and agriculture production. An example would be African countries. The semi-periphery, which would lie somewhere in the middle, these are exploited by the core and they also exploit the periphery countries. So these would be characterized by recent expansion into manufacturing areas no longer profitable in the core. So some examples would be India and Bangladesh. Okay. All right. So a background of the evolution of the dependency theory it was developed in the 1950s under Raul Prebisch. He stated that poor countries exported primary commodities to the rich countries who then manufactured products out of those commodities and then sold them back to the poorer countries. Prebisch's solution was that poor countries should embark on a program of import substitution so that they don't need to purchase the manufactured products from the richer countries. This would enable them to keep them, more of their money for development in other areas such as education and health. The poor countries would still sell their primary products on the world market but their foreign exchange reserves would not be used to purchase their manufacturers from abroad. At this point dependency theory was viewed as a possible way of exploit, explaining the persistent poverty of the poorer countries. As we see here poor countries feeding the much healthier, rich countries. <laughs> Who's Paul Prebisch? He was an Argentine economist known for his contributions to structural eco economics, such as the Prebisch-Singer hypothesis, which formed the basis of economic dependency theory. He became the executive director of the Economic Commission for Latin America, ECLA, or CEPAL, in 1950. In 1950, he also released the very influential study the Economic Development of Latin America, 
and its principal problems. Premise separated out the purely the theoretical aspects of economics from the actual practice of trade and the power structures that underlie trading institutions and agreements. So basically, he looked at it, capitalism should work, however, it does not seem to work for poor countries. So his resulting division of the world into the economic center, consisting of industrialized nations such as the US and the periphery, consisting of primary producers remains used to this day. How has dependency, affected, dependency theory affected Caribbean development? This has, dependency theory has a prevailing relevance in explaining the persistent poverty and underdevelopment of the Caribbean. The peculiar experience of slavery and colonialism play an influential role because we're dependent on those larger countries. Caribbean economist Norman Gervin, 2012, explained that Caribbean states enter the world as plantation economies, fueling other countries' development rather than its own. So, dependency theory would ex go way back. And Caribbean dependency is both structural and psychological. Um, Robert Boudin, 19, 2007, rightfully pointed out that the technocrats in various areas of public policy and government are limited to routine rather than creativity in their policy um, options. And Dr. Jennifer Mohammed sees dependency as a psychological condition in which the colonizer is seen as the legitimate sources of ideas. So it's more than just um, depending on the core countries for resources, it's also depending on them for the way forward ideas. So that's the end of economic um, intellectual traditions. Now we're going into the area of gender. So the first, the first in, um, intellectual tradition in this area is male marginalization. What is that? So male marginalization is a theory which was first introduced by Errol Miller in the Caribbean during the late 1980s. Male marginalization is described as a situation where males are put at a disadvantage in and which has hampered, the, which has hampered their development in society. According to Patricia Ellis, 2003, marginalization of Caribbean men is seen to be the result of competition between men and women for power, changing societal norms and values, the construction of masculinity and femininity, segregation and the erosion of the traditional role of the male as a breadwinner, provider, and protector. So male marginalization involves reverse roles in the family, with women as the breadwinner, um, boy de declining participation and performance in the educa educational system of boys, and this definition defines what has been happening to our men in the Caribbean. Errol Miller, he was born in 1938 in Jamaica. He was an educator extraordinaire who is the first among local educators to do significant research on issues of race, gender, and other social issues as they affected education. He developed the theory of place out of which the research on male marginalization and other issues have been examined. He also wrote the book, Men at Risk. Errol Miller presented one of the first pieces of work around male marginalization in the Caribbean in the late 1980s. They posed that women and girls are being empowered at the expense of men and boys. According to Miller, men and boys are at risk as a result of changes in how boys and girls are educated. That is, you have low number of single education to co-educational schools, so lots of mixing of the genders and then you have the allocation of scarce resources. He concluded that much of this is a result of the agenda driven by several stakeholders, including the World Bank and other developmental partners, which have directed their resources to women and girls' development at the expense of men. Errol Miller has earned several locally and internationally um, international awards and recognition. 
independent senator. He was made an independent senator in the Jamaican Parliament, 1984 to 1989. He was Professor Emeritus of the School of Education on the Mona campus in 2007. And in 2008, he was the first chancellor of the Michael University College and much more. Barry Chavans. Barry Chavans was born on um, 7th of January 1940 in Jamaica and died in 2010. He was a sociologist and, a th and an authority on Rastafarianism and his work impacted the lives of persons located outside the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. He focused on three main areas of male marginalization in the Caribbean, sexual behavior, education, and crime. In 1991, Barry Chavans formed Fathers Incorporated, a group catering largely to working class Jamaican men. The group aimed to counter negative stereotypes of men in the region and to install a sense of responsibility in men towards their children and society. In 1997, Fathers Incorporated presented the annual Model Father Award to recognize fathers who love, nurture, and provide for their families. He, Barry Chavan's contribution to the Caribbean Society has awarded him with several recognitions, Chairman of the Council of the Institute of Jamaica, Chairman of the Jamaican Justice Reform Task Force. How has this theory affected Caribbean development? Well, the theory helped to point out the consequences of sidelining men in the family. While women empowerment is good, we must also engage men to be actively involved and committed to redistribution power, redistributing power and privilege. The familiar roles of men are perceived as being limited to providing economic support and occasional discipline. Although the stereotype of the breadwinner is usually male in the Caribbean, as in we think that's the way, in reality it has become less over the years with women taking the lead, particularly in single parent households. And although men didn't always live with their families, they maintained influence. So men who take on greater caregiving roles experience deeper connections with children and partners and are more likely to have better physical and mental health and relationship with family. A man's increased participation in children's lives also leads to more positive outcomes for children. A lot of Caribbean men have witnessed violence to an extent and it affects them psychologically and so refraining from violence allows them to be more trusting and respect their relationships with their children and women and other men. So interpersonal struggles change them and give them their conceptions of what it is to be a man. So this is a contribution. Next is Caribbean feminism. <clears throat> Feminists are women or men who are concerned with the inequities being suffered by women as a group. In the US, women were involved in the anti-slavery and suffragette movements. Feminiz feminism in the Caribbean, however, refers to the collection of movements and ideologies aimed at defining, establishing, and defending a state of equal political, e economic, cultural, and social rights for women in the Caribbean. At the onset of the Atlantic slave trade, black male labor was largely flavor favored to that of black female labor. Eventually, women were seen as a means to maximize economic profitability through reproducing laborers. This meant that historically, females were valued largely for their re reproductive capabilities, which was thought to be an integral part of plantation sustainability. The slave trade and indentured servitude launched the racial and gendered institutional struggles that women would face for time to come. Some history. Um, the 1970s marked a time in which the feminist movement really gained traction. The following decade included a number of attempts at interregionally building transnational feminist networks that spread geographically between Latin America and the Caribbean. This platform founded and established by young leftist generations. One of the main concerns of Caribbean feminists is to produce a realistically engendered history of the region one that opposes the traditional focus on male-dominated activities in history such as war, government, diplomacy, economy, and religion. 
Women were always participants or present during significant events in the Caribbean. They just weren't recorded. So some key findings um, through Caribbean feminism. Um, they discovered that black slave families as nuclear units did exist and that women rebelled their enslaved status continually but were left out of the history books. Another finding is that the issues of white Western women differ differed significantly from the issues of Caribbean women. Example, in Western societies, males are the breadwinners and females assign domestic roles. In the Caribbean, especially from the lower classes, women were more often the consistent breadwinners as well as the dominant adults in the home. For example, the women were the ones who went to market to sell the goods that were grown. Um, they controlled the money, so on and so forth. But being powerful in the home did not translate to being powerful in the public domain. So that's why women were left out of po politics and that's still a struggle to this day. Citizenship in the Caribbean is built on an image of maleness and the laws are based on men's lives. Example, in the, in the law books of certain countries, women are dependents of men, but men are not the dependents of women. Patriarchy is present in all cultures and ethnicities of the Caribbean, whether implicit or explicit. So that means in all the cultures, races, we, it, it is the male is the one who is dominant. One major Caribbean feminist would be Mary Seacole. Um, she was born in Jamaica, a free person of color in a slave society. She learned the healing arts from her mother and became a nurse by teaching herself and learning from doctors. She had a tremendous desire to help others and through this strength in nursing, she, she thought she could overcome racism and the limitations imposed on women. She tried to volunteer to work with Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War, but Nightingale would have nothing to do with her, probably because of her race. She went anyway and set up a hospital closer to the front and earned the respect of all those who knew her. The Mary Seacole Hall, the all-female hall at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus was named in her honor. Patricia Mohammed. Patricia Mohammed, born in 1954, is a Trinidadian scholar, writer, and filmmaker. She's currently a professor in gender and cultural studies at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine campus. Her primary research interests are in gender, development, and the role of art in the Caribbean imagination. Professor Patricia Mohammed has been involved in feminist act activism and scholarship for over two decades. Her academic publications include Gender in Caribbean Development, uh, Rethinking Caribbean Difference, um, Guest Editor of the Feminist Review, Rutledge Journals, Summer University, was it? Summer 1989. Oh. I'm getting confused. Right. Her academic publications include Gender in Caribbean Development, 1998, Rethinking Caribbean Difference, a guest editor in the Feminist Review, um, Caribbean Women at the Crossroads with Althea Perkins, and along with numerous essays in journals and books, magazines, and newspapers. So now we're moving into the ethnic um, intellectual traditions. So this, these are Indo-Caribbean thought and indigenous perspectives. Indigenous people of the Caribbean. So these were the first inhabitants of the West Indies. The indigenous peoples of the Caribbean would include the Tainos, the island Caribs of the Lesser Antilles, and the uh, Guanahatabe of Western Cuba. So all of this um, grouping would be under Amerindians. So the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean have pivoted the foundation and shape of the Caribbean because of their cultures, heritage, and practices that have been spread around the Caribbean. 
We now utilize traditions of the indigenous peoples in modern ways, such as cultivating crops like cassava, fishing, and hunt, hunting small animals. The Tainos were perceived to be very caring and lovely people. They were food gatherers and hunters, living peacefully among nature and utilizing its provisions. During the time of European settlement and the implementation of encomienda, the Caribbean peoples faced many pe issues that even led to mass genocide of over three million indigenous people. Um, they suffered tremendously. They were enslaved, tortured, killed, forced to live in harsh conditions in submission for periods at a time, and significantly their lands and rights to freedom were ripped from them. Many of them died due to illnesses brought by the Europeans in which their immune system could not handle, wiping out mo most of their existence. Um, smallpox was the major problem. Some indigenous tribes still exist around us to this day in islands such as Hispaniola, Dominica, Trinidad, and Guyana. So some major issues that um, this set of people have, they want to deconstruct myths. So the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean are seeking to change a powerful myth which the Europeans created about them, that they are extinct or not pure. So this myth gave European capitalists the freedom to move into ancestral territory and set up mining and timber industries as if there were no previous owners. There's also the issue of marginalization. So they tend not to be considered, they tend to be considered separate from the main population and are not given the same rights as other citizens. So for example, access to education, there's usually low enrollment and graduation rates, and access to utilities is very low. They tend to live in poverty, battling disease and isolation, and a lack of amenities. Land rights is also a major issue. The ownership of ancestral lands are questioned or ignored. For example, in Dominica, the ruling was that it was not a state within a state, therefore the laws of the land take precedence. And in Guyana, the Amerindians have been engaged in a protracted struggle to have their claims to their land formalized. Indo-Caribbean peoples. So Indo-Caribbean are Caribbean people with roots in the Indian subcontinent. They're mostly descendants of the original indentured workers brought by the British, the Dutch, and the French during colonial times. Between 1845 and 1917, a total of 239,000 Indians migrated to British Guiana, now Guyana, 144,000 to Trinidad, approximately, and 36,000 to Jamaica under the system of indenture, Indian indenture. Most of these indentured laborers were brought, drawn from the agricultural and laboring classes of the Uttar Pradesh and Bihar regions of North India, with a comparatively smaller number being recruited from Bengal and various areas in South India. Approximately 85% were Hindus and 14% Muslims. So the arrival of the Indian, Indian indentured laborers into Trinidad, Guyana, and Jamaica seemed to provide the solution to the um, economic and labor crises at the time. That was after emancipation. The slaves left, the ex-slaves left the plantations and said they're not gonna work, so they needed an, another workforce. They also saw the introduction of a new dimension to the social and cultural fabric of these societies. The dynamism of the experience of Indian indenture is evident in the multifarious debates that it has spawned, debates that continuously reaffirm the global presence and contribution of the Indian indenture diaspora. So some major issues that this group of people have, racial tension. So um, you have cultural plural, pluralism and ethnic relations in Trinidad and Ghana have shown decided tension between Africans and Indians, which have entered the political sphere with mostly black or mostly Indian parties. 
And when one party is in power, those who are disenfranchised descend into poverty or migrate. This obviously affects overall development of the society. Another issue is identity. They have strong ethnic loyalties to their ancestral country, which interferes with their national identity. Example, are they Guyanese or are they Indian? So some Indo-Caribbean Indo writers, as they explore this issue, they say that these ties are imagined since many have never been to India. Well-established Indo-Trinidadian writers such as V.S. Naipaul and Indo-Guyanese writers like Clem Cicheran have explored themes of family dynamics, um, such as extended families dominated by men, inter-ethnic relations, the, the dilemma of being Indian in a foreign land, and how migration and enhances these issues. So, this is the end of the intellectual traditions. And in conclusion, these traditions have been described as ideologies that have served to inspire people of the region to improve some social conditions in their life, uh, which they felt were oppressive. These philosophies translated not only into written works, but also into the lives of great men and women, as well as the organizations that they found. Thank you very much for listening. You've been watching Homeschool 101, a partnership between ABS Television and the Ministry of Education. Thank you for viewing this lesson. Join us again next time.